My name is Eric Kislik and I'm an international master. This video will be about opening chess principles. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to explain the three main principles and a fourth reason that moves are played in the opening. And then we're going to test these out and see how they apply to real games and see if it all makes sense, you know, just to sort of apply the theory. So the first point, usually what occurs very early on in the game within the first five moves, is the idea is to control the center with pawns. Essentially, if your opponent will let you take over the entire center with pawns, do so. Because imagine what will happen if you control the whole center. It means you'll have more active pieces, a better pawn structure, a safer king, and more potential threats. That's a lot going for you and nothing going for the opponent. So controlling the center with pawns is very important and every single major chess opening attempts to control the center with pawns in some way or another. Even if they temporarily let the opponent occupy the center with pawns first. So we'll be looking at that as well. So the second main idea is to develop your pieces. And this often means something like thinking about your worst place piece to avoid neglecting development. So you can think of it as, let's say you have three pieces that are not developed that are just not in play and it's already moved 15 or 20. Imagine it as if you have three able-bodied workers on your payroll, but they're not doing anything. And another way of looking at it is, think about trying to attack the opponent. A queen on its own usually cannot do very much because it's just one piece attacking, so they only need one piece defending to ward off the threats. Imagine if you have six pieces attacking and they only have one or two defenders well, you have a very good chance of overpowering the opponent. So if you think a lot about developing your pieces and having active pieces, that's going to be very important. So the third main idea is to try to protect your king. Generally, in the first 10 or 15 moves, most players will try to castle their king, either to the queen side or more commonly on the king side. So, because generally the king is safest in one of the corners where it is hardest to attack, but in some cases, it can also be safe on its home square, or on f1, or f8, or if the queens come off the board and there are no threats to the king in the center, sometimes it can, it can go elsewhere. But the reason why it's very important to protect your king is because checkmate ends the game, so king safety naturally is, is of paramount importance. And the fourth main thing, which might be a little bit harder to grasp and a little bit harder to understand, is that in the opening, we will also play moves that either make a threat or react to an opponent's threat. And in some cases, the ideas behind the moves can be very simple. For instance, you might be slightly misplacing an opponent's piece, or you might be challenging them in the center or chasing the queen away from a good square. There are all sorts of little reasons why you might want to make a threat. So these are the, these are the essential three main principles, control the center with pawns, Develop your pieces generally as quickly as possible and try to make sure you have a safe king. So these are the main three things we're going to be trying to do, but we will also sometimes make threats or react to the opponent's threats. It's very important to not miss what the opponent's threats are because, for instance, we don't want to lose a piece or we don't want to lose a key central pawn. A lot of the times when players think about developing their pieces really quickly, they suddenly forget when the opponent attacks one of their central pawns. And if you lose your central pawn, you know, one or two central pawns very early in the game, it can be very, very costly. So let's, let's use these principles and let's look over five recent Grandmaster games that were actually played yesterday in this big tournament called the Granky Chess Classic. So let's test it out and we'll look over these games. So the first game I want to look at is a game that featured the world champion. So let's just go move by move. And let's see how, how these principles apply. So for instance, remember, we're thinking about controlling the center with pawns, developing, protecting the king, and we're also keeping an eye out for threats. Okay, so d4 was played. That was the first move. This controls the center with pawns, and it also prepares to play e4 on the next move. Black plays the move knight to f6. This develops and also prevents white from playing the move e4. So both sides are doing the same sort of thing here. White goes c4, controlling the center with a pawn. Black plays g6. So what black's trying to do is play bishop to g7 and castle. So black is basically just planning to protect the king. So 
This is both developing and also trying to protect the king. So white plays knight to c3, a developing move, but also one aimed at occupying the center with e4. Black plays bishop to g7, both developing and also preparing to protect the king. So white plays the move e4. So white has succeeded in controlling the center very well with pawns, and after this will prepare to develop and then protect the king. So black plays the move d6, which is a generally useful move, kind of keeps an eye out on e5, so that it'll be more difficult for white to try to gain space. Also allows black to later think about striking back at the center to control it with pawns with either c5 or e5. So white plays the move knight to f3, developing and also preparing to play, for example, bishop e2 and castle to protect the king. Black castles. Okay, so black has succeeded in developing quite quickly and protecting the king. So for after five moves, black has put the king on a safe square. And really the only main goal now is how to challenge the center and control the center with pawns. So we'll be seeing how this applies essentially on the next move. So here, bishop to e2 was played by white. So now that white controls the center with pawns, white's just aiming to simply develop and then protect the king. So black reacted with the move e5. And what this does is it directly tries to challenge the center. And there's also an important point here. Um, it's important to realize that <laughs> we're not exactly able to, to simply win the pawn like you might think. For instance, if d takes e5, d takes e5, queen takes d8, rook takes d8, it, the pawn is not hanging on e5 because if knight takes e5, there's the move, knight takes e4 attacking the undefended knight on e5. So that would actually just be equal. So instead of this, white developed with the move bishop to e3. So white's development is actually pretty good. You can see all four of the minor pieces are in play. The plan is simply to protect the king and white has a pretty good center. So black should try to react pretty quickly. So black played e takes d4 and essentially what the idea was is to try to challenge white's control of the center with pawns. So this was a direct threat. This is number four, the direct threat idea. So knight takes d4 was played and now black played rook to e8, attacking the e4 pawn. So black is both developing, challenging the opponent's control of the center with pawns and creating a threat. So white plays the move f3, simply reacting to the threat and black plays the move c6. So now black's idea is point number one, trying to control the center with pawns. So black is hoping to go d5 and most likely challenge the e4 pawn. So white should react to this threat. So white played the move bishop to f2 so that the bishop is not undefended on the e3 square. And now black played the move d5. So let's assess what has happened here. After these moves, for at, at the beginning, white controlled the center well with pawns, but now black has done a good job of fighting back against it, and now black has equalized by controlling the center with pawns effectively himself. Black has developed pretty well, white has developed pretty well with all four of the minor pieces in play, and black has protected his king quite well. So essentially what white did now, just to illustrate a few more moves, white played e takes d5, c takes d5 and castled. And by this stage, you can see both sides controlled the center well with pawns. Both sides developed their pieces well. And now after castling, white has succeeded in protecting the king. So we can say after the first 12 moves that both sides did a very good job of handling the opening principles and applying them quite well. So the position was only approximately equal, but this is still a very nice illustration of the basic principles. So let's go on to the next one and see how they apply in the next game. So the next game was between Viswanath Anand and Aronian, two of the best players in the world. White played the move e4, controlling the center with a pawn and intending to play d4 if that's allowed. So black plays the move e5, controlling d4, making it harder for white to do that. And white develops with the move knight to f3, attacking the e5 pawn. So black simply reacts with knight to c6, developing and controlling the e5 pawn and uh, making sure it's safe. 
So white plays the move bishop to b5, which in some cases threatens to take the knight and keep some pressure on e5, although perhaps not immediately because the e4 pawn is also undefended. So now black played the move knight to f6, which counters by challenging the e4 pawn. So it's, it's not only a threat, but it also develops. So white reacted to this with the move d3. So this will help white to develop. It controls the center with pawns, and it reacts to the threat against the e4 pawn. So d3 is played, and now black played the move bishop to c5. And this has a little subtle point to it. One of the points here is that in this case, for instance, if white tries to win material here, let's say if bishop takes c6, d takes c6, notice that this pawn looks like it's hanging here. But if knight takes e5, notice that the knight is undefended. And again, we have tactics here. We could play the move bishop takes f2 check, king takes f2, and queen to d4 check. And then we're able to regain the knight on the e5 square. So that's an important little tactic that black is able to utilize. So everything is safe here. So white plays the move c3. So one of the things that this does is it controls the center with pawns. It controls a certain square. It counters the idea of playing knight to d4. And it also, in some cases, will allow white to play the move d4 a bit later, after white has castled. So black castled. And this succeeds in protecting the king. And now white castled. So now there actually is a threat to take on c6 and then take the e5 pawn. So now black simply played the move rook to e8, which does an effective job of defending the pawn on e5. So as we can see so far, both sides have controlled the center with pawns. Both sides have developed relatively quickly. Both sides have protected their king. And in terms of threats, both sides are quite safe here. So white played the move bishop to g5, pinning the knight on f6. And this may have some ideas, for instance, to play d4 rather soon. So black decided to keep it nice and safe and simply play bishop to e7. And basically what this did is it just broke the pin and black can simply develop with the move d6, play nice and solid, have the center under control, and have no real problems to deal with here. White played the move rook to e1. This is a developing move and may prepare to play d4 in the near future. And so black reacted with the move d6, controlling the center with a pawn and preparing to develop. For instance, the move bishop to d7 makes a lot of sense. White played the move d4, carrying out the main plan. So what this did is it controlled the center effectively with pawns and white will prepare to maybe play the move d5 on the next move. So black played the move bishop to d7, simply developing and dealing with the threat. White played the move d5, effectively gaining space and challenging the knight on c6. So black had a threat to react to and simply played the move knight to b8. So we can assess what has happened here. Essentially, if we look at the pawn structure, we have a fixed pawn structure here. Black's done a nice job controlling the center with pawns. Black has reasonably good development here. For instance, I mean, three of the minor pieces are out. The rook is on a reasonable square. Both sides have a safe king, and neither side has any major threats to deal with. So we can say that based on the opening principles, both sides have done rather well. So let's go on to the next game. So the next game here is Georg Meyer versus Caruana, who just qualified to play in the World Championship. So let's take a look at the opening phase here and see how this looks. So e4 was played. Again, preparing to play d4. Black plays e5, so controlling the center with a pawn and countering the opponent's threat. Knight to f3, like we saw before, attacking the e5 pawn. Black plays knight to c6, defending the e5 pawn. White plays the move bishop to b5. A developing move, generally preparing to castle, and also keeping an eye on this pawn. So now, a6 was played. And you'll see the point. So this is a move that has a threat. It's threatening the bishop and trying to put it on a slightly worse square. Bishop a4 is a common move, but here we get to see what happens if bishop takes c6, which is what was played. So after bishop takes c6, d takes c6, 
black took back so that the queen can play an active role. If knight takes e5, we can play the move queen to d4. And now black is attacking the e5 knight and the e4 pawn. So essentially black will take back on e4 with check and black will have the bishop pair, which is generally worth about half a pawn, which should give black at least equality and perhaps even a slight advantage. So instead of taking on e5, white simply castled. So now white actually does have a threat of taking on e5. So now black played the interesting move queen to f6, which has a lot of different plans behind it, but essentially it's a developing move. It's trying to counter white's play in the center, and it also, in some cases, does have some threats. For example, bishop g4 can be one of the ideas. So the move d4 was played. White decides, well, I'm going to try to control the center with pawns. Black plays e takes d4 because there's no good way to maintain control over e5. And now white develops with bishop to g5, attacking the queen on f6. So black has to react to a threat and simply plays queen to d6. And now white plays knight takes d4. So now black's main issue here is how do I develop the pieces? As you can see, there are a lot of pieces that are not in play yet. So how can we challenge white's pieces and simply get our pieces out quickly? So black played the move bishop to e7. This is a nice move, challenging the bishop on g5. So if, if white decides to tra trade bishops, Black is happy with the exchange and simply develops the knight and is ready to castle very soon. So black has done a nice job of simply challenging the bishop on g5. And now white decided, okay, well, it'll be harder for my opponent to develop if I simply retreat. So white went back with bishop to e3, countering the threat. And now black decided, well, I can develop with knight to h6. And in some cases, I may even have ideas like knight to g4. So I can actually have a threat here trying to use my queen to target the h2 pawn where it would be mate. So knight to h6 not only develops, but it also has a threat with it. So white plays the move queen to d2, and this develops the queen, and it also has a threat. In some cases, bishop takes h6 can be an idea, but also bishop f4 attacking the queen can be a more natural idea if knight to g4. So now black played the move g5, and this might seem like a shocking counterintuitive, irrational looking move, but there's a very important point behind it. One of the points behind g5 is that it reacts to black's, it, it, black reacts to white's threat. So it reacts to the threat of bishop f4. With the pawn on g5, white is no longer able to play bishop f4. So black's idea can be to play knight to g4, attacking the bishop, and also threatening mate on h2. So this had a very useful point behind it. So the move g5, although it might have seemed a little bit ridiculous or a little bit crazy, it actually had a very, very good point behind it. And it would have been very risky for white to try to actually take that pawn because if white took the pawn, black could capture and play rook to g8, suddenly getting a very strong attack. So what we can see in the end here, at, at the, in this position, at the end of the first 10 moves, we can see both sides did a good job controlling the center with pawns. Both sides have developed their pieces in a very interesting way. Black has two minor pieces de developed and will develop the bishop on c8 soon. White has two minor pieces developed as well. Both sides actually have quite safe kings. The, the king on e8 might seem less safe, but it's important that the e-file is semi-closed. So it's not easy to actually get to the king. So all things considered, this was a very interesting novelty played by Caruana, and actually to assess the situation at the end of the opening, we can say it's approximately equal. So this was just a very interesting and exciting way to play the opening phase. So the result of the opening in this game as well went perfectly fine for white and perfectly fine for black. So this is about what we expect in a lot of these high level games. Let's go on to the next game. The next game was between Hu Yi Fan and Maxime Vacher Le Grave. So White played the move knight to f3, developing the knight, and later planning to occupy the center with pawns with one of these pawn moves. Black plays the move c5, and this controls the center with pawns, and we'll see how Black wants to continue after this. So White plays c4, controlling the center with a pawn, restricting d5, 
and you know white often plans to uh, occupy the center sometimes with knight c3, d4, and e4. So black plays the move knight to f6, playing symmetrically and also kind of restricting the idea of e4 if white wants to try to prepare it. So both sides here took a rather conservative approach and just said, okay, I'm just going to play simply. I'm going to develop my pieces and we'll see how the play develops after that. So white played the move g3 with the plan of developing the bishop and then castling the king and just getting out of the opening very quickly. So black played the move g6 intending the same idea. Um, now, to sort of challenge the idea of black putting the bishop here on this diagonal, white decided to play b3, which was a rare but interesting plan. This has been played a few times before. Black played bishop g7, bishop to b2 was played, and uh, black decided to mimic the idea and play b6 and complete development on the other side of the board. So white played bishop g2, preparing to castle, bishop to b7, developing the bishop, so it's com completely symmetrical here, castle and castle. So here we can see that both sides have controlled the center with pawns reasonably well. They've developed pretty well. Both sides have three minor pieces out. They both protected their king and there are no immediate threats. Okay, so now white plays the move d4. White finally stakes a claim in the center and probably wants to take back and make it difficult for black to get direct counterplay. So black, presumably worried about the idea of the space gaining d5, decided to take on d4, which is a very standard counter in this sort of position. And in some sense is, is a favorable general sort of exchange, trading off a c-pawn for the d-pawn. So queen takes d4 was played, white develops and recaptures the pawn. So black develops with knight c6, attacking the queen with tempo, and so white has to move the queen out of the way. White plays the move queen to c3, and this makes it a little bit awkward for black to move the knight from f6, although black may not be in an, in an immediate rush to do so. And here, black played the move queen to c7, simply developing and planning to play the move rook a d8 on the next move. So what we can see here is that both sides have done a pretty reasonable job of controlling the center with pawns. White has a slightly better pawn structure if we just look at the raw structure here. The pawns on c4, e2 versus d7, e7 leaves white with a little bit more space and leaves black a little bit more passive. But both sides have done a pretty good job with controlling the center with pawns. Both sides have developed pretty well. If you, if you look at the position, black has all four minor pieces developed, the king is safe, the rooks are going to come into play, so the development has been good by both sides. Both sides have a safe king, and both sides have no specific threats to deal with. So again, in this game, we can see that this has been rather high level play by both sides. And in all the examples we've looked at, neither side has any major problems because they've both handled the opening principles rather well. So let's take a look at one more game. The last game is Nidich versus Vichigov. This was one of the other games played in this round, and let's see if we can make sense of the opening moves here. So, white plays e4, controlling the center with pawns, hoping to build up an ideal pawn center with pawns on d4 and e4. Black plays the move e5, again countering this plan. If d4 is played, black will simply take, and then develop the knight with c6, gaining a slight initiative by being able to develop with tempo. So white plays the move knight to f3, again attacking the e5 pawn. Black develops by playing knight c6, defending the pawn. And now we get to see things, we get to see an idea slightly different than in one of the previous games. Bishop to b5 is played, targeting the knight, and in some cases just planning to simply castle and play c3 and d4 to control the center with pawns. So black plays the move a6, a move we saw in a previous game, where in the previous game bishop takes c6 was played. In this game, white simply retreated the bishop with bishop a4. So now knight to f6 was played. So this not only develops, but it also attacks the e4 pawn. So white reacted by simply playing d3. This controls the center with a pawn and reacts to a threat. Black plays bishop c5, developing the bishop and preparing to castle. So when you move out those kingside pieces and you plan to castle, which is what happens most of the time, you're preparing to castle. Essentially, 
You're developing, but you're also playing a useful move, planning to protect your king. So now white played the move c3, which is a multi-purpose move, but also a useful move. So not only does this control the center with pawn, but it also sometimes allows the bishop to drop back to the c2 square, which can be useful. And it also has the idea of preparing d4, usually after white has castled. So this is an idea that controls the center with a pawn and does have multiple other ideas. So black plays the move d6, controlling the e5 pawn, which was threatened by the previous move, by the way. And now white played the move bishop to g5, which is similar to something we saw in one of the earlier games. This is a slightly annoying pin that black may want to deal with in the near future. So black played the move bishop to a7, which might seem like a little bit of a strange move. You might think, well, isn't it odd to move the same, the same piece twice in the opening? Well, one of the points here is that although you move the bishop twice, one of the points is we've moved out of the way of any d4 ideas if they come in the near future. So what we've done is we've actually reacted to a threat and put a piece on a good square. Plus, we don't know yet where we want to put the king. We don't know yet if we want to put the king on this side of the board or not. So it's actually a little bit unclear at this moment whether we want to do this or not. So we, we may put the king on the queen's side. We may put the king on the king's side. It's absolutely not clear yet. So white developed with knight b to d2. And now black played h6, which is a move with a threat. Black would be happy to take the bishop pair after bishop takes f6, queen takes f6. So white simply reacted to a threat and maintained the pin that's here on the knight. So what black did now was simply break the pin on the other knight by playing bishop to d7, which is also an idea that we saw in one of the earlier games. So black succeeds in developing and in countering a threat. So now white played the move knight to f1, which is an interesting idea. Sometimes the knight can, can, for example, come to e3, and it may be useful here or here. So white is preparing to complete development this way. And white may also simply move the queen out of the way. For instance, a common plan is to go queen to e2 and may actually queenside castle. So although it, again, looks like you know white might be doing something that looks a little bit strange, White doesn't know yet where to put the king, whether to put it on the king side or the queen side. So white is still making a useful move that tries to control the center more effectively. So now black played the move g5, which carried a direct threat with it. And white simply reacted by playing bishop to g3. And I'll just show a few more moves. Now black played the move knight to e7, which in many cases is preparing to exchange bishops. White developed with knight to e3, putting the knight arguably on its best square. And now black simply played the move knight to g6, which is quite a nice square for the knight, which potentially can go to the f4 square. So here is a good moment to kind of pause and judge the results of the opening. Both sides have controlled the center reasonably well with pawns. You can see they actually have a symmetrical basic central pawn structure. Both sides have developed rather well, you'll notice, both sides have all four of their minor pieces out and in play. The only thing they haven't done is protect their king, but notice that the position is 100% closed right now. There are no open files. There is nothing open for any of the rooks to attack anything, so it's actually okay that this has been delayed at the, at the moment. And in terms of direct threats, there are no direct threats for either side. So I'm just going to illustrate a few more moves just to show you how they succeeded in protecting the king because both sides have done a similar job of controlling the center with pawns. Both sides have done a similar job of developing, but they haven't necessarily protected their kings yet. So let me make a few more moves. Knight to f5 was played. Black played knight to e7, targeting the knight on f5. The knight went back. Black repeated moves with knight to g6. Bishop to b3 was played, and now black simply played queen to e7, which can allow black to castle queenside to protect the king. Now white needs to move the queen first if white wants the queenside castle. So white went queen to c2, black queenside castled, and white queenside castled. So now is probably the best moment to judge the results of the opening, and did both sides actually follow these opening principles? 
I would say yes, 100%. Both sides control the center with pawns. You can see the central pawn structure is symmetrical. Both sides have, have developed about equally. All of the minor pieces are out and the queens are both developed. And both sides have castled their kings to the same side of the board and are equally safe. And there are no direct threats for either side. So all things considered, this is how it pans out in practical grandmaster play. You can see, if you think about the opening from this perspective, it makes perfect sense. This is exactly the kind of simple sort of thing that I wish I had learned when I started playing because when you don't think about it from this perspective, a lot of the moves will just pass by you and you'll go, what was the point of that? What was the point of that? What was the point of that? But then you go, oh, okay, he's just trying to control the center with pawns or trying to develop the pieces or trying to protect the king or there was a threat that was made and they're either making that threat or reacting to that threat. Sometimes that threat might not be directly obvious but if you realize that that's one of the only other things they could be trying to do, you'll probably realize by process of elimination that that's what they were aiming for. So when you think about it from this perspective, you know what to focus on and you know what to look for. And you'd be surprised, but probably you know 95% or more of Grandmaster games feature the first 10 moves by both sides doing all of these things from one to four, you know, just on, on different moves. The, these move, these principles basically explain every single move that's being played in these high-level games. So this will really help you to understand what they're doing in the opening. And I know they may seem kind of basic or simple, but it's important to think about it from this perspective because what may have been confusing or not made sense before will suddenly start to make sense. So in your own games, think about these main principles and also think about, well, when is it worthwhile to make a threat that perhaps weakens the opponent's central control or pushes the opponent's piece to a worse square or when is it useful to react to the opponent's threats. So that's something that is frequently missed out by amateur players but is important to think about. So think about controlling the center with pawns, think about developing your pieces as quickly as possible and not leaving any pieces behind and think about making sure you protect your king and if you follow these principles you'll handle the opening very well. This has been International Master Eric Kislik.